professor R Ashokamani former professor and head of the department of physics at Anna University Chennai and presently guiding five research scholars he has more than 40 years of ug and pg teaching experience and 25 years of research experience 14 research scholars have obtained doctorate under his guidance in the area of solid state physics He has more than 150 research publications to his credit of which 90 are in international journals. He has authored a book on solid state physics which has an international publication. He has participated in several international conferences both in India and abroad. He is a fellow and treasurer of Tamil Nadu Academy of Sciences. Welcome to the UGC lecture series in applied electronics and we have been going through a section on bonding in solids which forms a chapter in the paper on physics of materials and in the section on bonding in solids we are going through the lecture number 12 which is with the title x-ray diffraction and the contents of uh, the lecture or continuous and uh, characteristic x rays anode target materials bragg's law primary uses of x rays and uh, lobby diffraction and uh, what is x ray crystallography you know the x rays which were uh, accidentally discovered by ronjan can be used for in many areas but with the got to material science it can be used to study the arrangement of atoms in a crystal you take a, any material it may be organic material or inorganic material it may be what, whatever be the material that you have the atomic arrangements can be studied using x rays a beam of x ray strikes a crystal and causes the beam of light to spread into many directions from the angles and intensities of these diffracted beams a crystallographer can produce a three dimensional picture of the density of electrons i showed some time back the electron density contours in germanium the with the primary objective of uh, telling you how the electrons are preferentially oriented between two germanium atoms to show the directional bonding that is how the electrons are distributed so the electronic density distribution the density of electrons how they are distributed in crystals and similarly the arrangement of atoms can be studied using x rays this is known as x ray crystallography broadly from the electron density the following features can be determined or obtained the mean positions of the atoms in the crystal the chemical bonds right and the disorder and various other informations can be obtained from x ray diffraction studies primarily x ray diffraction is used to study the arrangement of atoms by arrangement of atoms what i mean is you would have studied in high school that a particular solid is crystallizing in the face centered cubic structure or another solid crystallizing in the body centered cubic structure or hexagonal structure or diamond structure these crystal structures and the interatomic distances all these things can be obtained by x ray diffraction not only the positions of atoms but also the the way in which electrons are distributed no longer you consider the electrons as orbits revolving in orbits in atoms or in general so how the electron density clouds are arranged right electron density contours are seen in order to know the nature of the bonding whether ionic bonding covalent bonding these things can be obtained by x ray diffraction okay now the credit of um, accidentally observing x ray diffraction goes to ronjan now 
what Röntgen did was to send uh, an electron beam, an accelerated electron beam, and it was made to hit at the tor jet, as I will be showing just now. And from the tor jet or the anode, you get X rays, right? And the nature of the rays which are coming from the tor jet were not known at the time when Röntgen discovered these rays. And as uh, mathematicians do, the unknown quantity is uh, kept as x. You are asked to solve the equations, determine the quantities x and y or the quantity x is unknown quantity. So, that is the reason why they are called x rays because the nature of the rays were not known at the time when the discovery was made. It was the year 1895. Uh, for that, the first Nobel prize in physics was awarded to Röntgen in the year 1901. He was honored by the Nobel prize for physics and in 1995, the German post edited a stamp dedicated to Wil Wilhelm Konrad Röntgen. In Germany, they are called the Röntgen rays right? or Röntgen rays, Röntgen rays and then in general we call it as X rays. right? So, we will read more about X rays and uh, their proper I mean the properties and uh, you know the wavelength and uh, things like that how they are produced and so on. And this is a stamp that is uh, issued by the German uh, postal department in 1895 in Bonn. You see the stamp here may be one Deutsch mark at that time Any, anyway we will uh, pass on to the this is a picture of Röntgen again and uh, you observe the surprising thing was uh, it is told that uh, Röntgen was afraid of uh, the nature of the radiation coming from the tor jet or the, the x-rays. So, what he did was to catch hold of his wife's hand. So, the easiest thing a scientist can do instead of testing himself uh, catching the hand of uh, his wife and uh, he had uh, the first few photographs can be seen in if you go to Munich the big museum in Munich where the first few photographs which were taken by Röntgen are displayed and you see the Mrs. Röntgen's hand right. You see the ring right she is wearing the metallic ring. Similarly, when you take x-ray of uh, you know mouth or you have got uh, some dental implant uh, cobalt chromium as I used to have and you can see the metallic part right. Uh, so, it is uh, I mean not uh, transparent like uh, okay, not like flesh and uh, it will be the difference between the normal tooth and the me metallic system. Similarly, here you see the bone right the x-ray will pass through the flesh right, but not through the bone you see the bone here x-ray will pass through the flesh and the bone is seen here and this is the ring is seen here there is a ring which is. Uh, owned by Mrs. Röntgen. So, the Mrs. Röntgen's hand can be seen. So, this is what uh, was done by Röntgen the interaction between Röntgen and uh, his wife. Okay. This is a simple x-ray diffraction you have the electron beam hitting at a tor jet right the tor jet and then you get um, a, a diffraction experiment right a diffracted uh, rings something like uh, uh, Newton's rings that you have you would have studied in uh, school or in the elementary level at a college the Newton's rings right. Uh, the Newton's rings are uh, uh, due to the wave nature of light. Similarly, the you know the kind of uh, diffraction that you have the x rays or uh, waves a part of the electromagnetic spectrum and so when they are hitting the tor jet then you get what is called the, the diffracted beam that, that is the x ray diffraction that you have. We will see this in a greater detail the time to come. So, what you observe now a beam of electrons are coming and uh, they are made to be incident on a tor jet right. The beam electron beam is coming and hitting at a tor jet and now comes um, uh, the x rays and uh, and these x rays uh, uh, you can have on a film or whatever be a thing right x rays can be you know in a, in medical field the x rays are taken and uh, you have um, a film uh, in which uh, the x rays are taken and uh, or uh, you got other methods of uh, advanced methods uh, for uh, studying the atomic arrangements in solids. So, you got um, 
okay, the detectors and so on. So, an accelerating charge radiates electromagnetic radiation, right? Charge gives rise to electromagnetic radiation. Any accelerated charge particle will give rise to, according to electromagnetic theory of uh, Maxwell, any accelerated charge particle will give rise to electromagnetic radiation. So, you, when you go into the detail, you will be seeing both the characteristic line spectrum and the 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 Bremsstrahlung radiation or the breaking radiation. So, the principle of an x-ray tube is shown here. What you have here is a cathode. You see the cathode here and uh, uh, you have got an anode here. Okay. If the cathode is here a filament from which uh, the electrons are coming right. You have the cathode from which uh, upon heating either thermionic heating you know normally use a thermionic heating and uh, electrons are coming they are uh, impinging on a target and you may ask what is the target material. The target material may be copper or molybdenum or iron or cobalt or uh, chromium. Now, these are the common targets used and uh, now when the electrons are hitting the target what you observe is um, uh, the x-rays are coming right. So, the fast moving electrons when they hit at a target uh, anode the anode target may be a, usually a copper target right a copper target and from the copper target you get a the x-ray beam and uh, you should know when you are talking about x-rays what are the wavelength region right what what are the characteristic lines and what is the continuous x-rays right the characteristic line spectrum and the continuous spectrum. The continuous spectrum is called the Bremsstrahlung radiation and so, you will be having x rays right. So, uh, what you find is uh, you have them the high energy beam is hitting and from them from the target comes the x ray beam right. What is the principle behind the Bremsstrahlung and the, the characteristic x ray lines. Now, as I told you, you in the target you have got atoms right the copper atoms or in the molybdenum target you will be having molybdenum atoms right. Now, let us look at one particular atom it may be a copper atom here right you have got a copper atom as I told you you have got a fast moving electron fast incident electron the electron is coming here right it is entering into the atom you have got a nucleus here you have got electrons revolving in orbits. So, atom at the anode material okay, and um, you have got atom here. Now, what happens is this electron comes here it interacts with uh, the system the, the ejected electron it gets slowed down and change in direction the, the electron is coming and this electron is coming here it does not go straight. What happens is you have the electron giving rise to x rays right you have got a the fast moving electron it interacts with the atom I will go into the details later, but it interacts with the atom and in that process uh, what happens is the electron takes a um, different direction you have the x rays coming in this direction right. Now, when you are talking about x rays now we should talk about mainly about them the characteristic x rays and then we will pass on to x ray diffraction for electromagnetic radiation to be diffracted the spacing of the grating should be of the same order as that of the wavelength. What I would like to tell you is if a crystal is um, assumed to be like a grating and you want to have x ray diffraction the wavelength of the x ray beam and the, the interatomic spacing should be more or less the same order. What is the distance that separates the two atoms in a better like say strontium. In the whole of periodic table strontium has got the highest interatomic distance. The in, in general you take all the solids in the periodic table the distance separating two atoms varies from 2 to 5 angstroms. So, maybe strontium is one of the elements which has got the highest interatomic distance whereas, the other solids it will be less than 5 angstroms right. So, in principle the interatomic distance in silicon, germanium, copper, molybdenum everything will be 
may be iron whatever be the thing all solids will be ranging from 2 to 5 angstroms right 2 to 3 angstroms or 2 to 5 angstroms. In crystals the typical interatomic spacing will be around 2, 2 to 3 angstroms most of the solids, but st strong stream is an exception wherein the x-ray diffraction the distance is very large. Hence, x-rays can be used to study the crystal structure because the distance are same. You may ask the question why cannot you study the structure or why cannot you study uh, I want to study something uh, what you have in this paper or I want to see this object. Now, if I want to see this object the wavelength that is used here should be comparable to the size of the object right. So, the natural light will be enough to see this object, but on the other hand when you go to angstrom level you know the the distance that separates the atoms or in the angstrom level the human eye cannot see objects whether you can see atoms you have got atoms in this material in this plastic or in this paper or in any other material you have got atoms can I see the atoms the atoms cannot be seen right. So, you have got the visible region and you have got um, the infrared ultraviolet so on. So, the wavelength of x rays in general varies from 1 to 100 angstroms. Okay. So, the interatomic distance varies from 1 to 5 angstroms. Now, therefore, if you want to study the, um, the interatomic distance in solids then you have to use x rays whose wavelength matches with the interatomic distance. Now, therefore, you have to use x rays ordinary light cannot see cannot be used to study the atoms right the atomic arrangements or uh, the structure of in which the atoms uh, are arranged whether it is body centered cubic or face centered cubic the atomic arrangements uh, the distance of separating atoms cannot be seen cannot be studied by ordinary light is it uh, whether copper is body centered cubic or face centered cubic or external close pack what is the kind of arrangement of atoms that you have the arrangement of atoms can be seen only by x rays and not only the arrangement of atoms and also the interatomic distance all this is can be obtained using x ray diffraction using x rays. So, I will come across what is called a Bragg's law which will tell you you know atoms are arranged in periodically in a regular pattern way in any solid you have got a, a plane here wherein you have got atoms arranged in a periodic manner and similarly atoms arranged in a periodic manner here another plane the this is the distance separating the two planes it is called a interplane or separation right. The interplane or separation can be obtained from what is called Bragg's law and again the this distance can be measured using x rays ok. So, we again go through the x ray generation what a, what, a, what, a, what exactly happens here you see here it is a very interesting animation you see here you this is a k shell and the l shell right. Now, you got a atom at the k shell. Now, the fast moving electron that is coming here and is a torjet is a one of the atoms in the torjet right it is a copper torjet or a molybdenum torjet. Now, what happens now you fast moving electron is coming here right let me uh, wait for some time right the electron is coming here what it does it throws the electron from the k shell it throws the electron somewhere right the electron goes and now the k shell is open right because uh, atom electron has been removed. So, what happens from the higher state the electron should come down to the lower state you have studied the Baumer series Lyman series etcetera in hydrogen spectrum. So, if an atom is removed then the the other electrons if the electron is removed the other electron the higher energy level should come down right. So, electron in the k shell is removed ok then the electron the L shell should fall here right you see it again. Now, the electron in the k shell is removed by the incoming fast moving electron right. Then the electron in the L shell is coming down the energy difference between this shell and this shell right E L and E k the k shell and the L shell the energy difference using the Bohr's frequency condition what is Bohr's fre frequency condition E 2 minus E 1 is equal to H nu right this is the Bohr's frequency condition you got a one energy level E 2 another energy level E 1, when the electron is jumping from E 2 to E 1 the excess energy 
will be given out in the form of a photon right the, the difference in energy will come out in the form of a light photon and the frequency of the photon will be e 2 minus e 1 will be equal to h nu right you got a e 2 is a higher energy level e 1 is a lower energy level you take the hydrogen atom how do you get Lyman, Baumer all the other series passion bracket fund series you know Lyman series Baumer series passion bracket fund all the series what how do you obtain you take an electron the k shell you excite it make it to go to the l shell or still further m shell n shell and so on. So, whenever the electron is jumping from the higher shell to lower shell from the l shell to the k shell the electron will be coming down and the, the you know the when the electron is coming down a photon will be emitted right. Similarly, here when there is the absence of an electron here the electron the l shell will drop to the k shell right this is what is happening here the l shell is dropping to the k shell giving rise to a photon right. What is the frequency of the photon it is governed by the so called Bohr's frequency condition. So, when the electron is jumping from the l shell to the k shell the, this electron is coming here it interacts with the atom throws the electron in the k shell there is a vacancy caused in the k shell that vacancy is filled by the electron in the l shell the electron in the l shell jumps to the k shell in this process a light photon will be coming right it is called k alpha quantum right a radiation which is called k alpha right. Similarly, you will be having k beta k beta is the thing that when the electron is jumping from this is a k l m when the electron is knocked off from the k shell electron from the m shell will go to the k shell right from the m shell it goes to the k shell that is called k beta right k beta quantum ok. I will show in the slides to come the k alpha radiation and the k beta radiation and the wavelengths and those wavelengths are used to study them the crystal structures that is the reason why I am telling about the energy levels the k, the, the k shell I showed you the, the k shell energy the l shell energy is m shell. So, the energy levels of the electrons in atoms right you got the k shell the l shell m shell and so on right and um, the intensity ratios of uh, uh, k alpha 1 the k alpha 1 this is called the k alpha 2 this radiation coming from this level to this level is called k alpha 2 k beta. The, the ratio is uh, like this 10 is to 5 is to 2. So, k alpha 1 will have a higher intensity right. So, uh, okay, once again I will show the same thing here the x rays falling on a target and uh, this gives rise to x rays. Okay. Now, you may ask a question what kind of targets are used and uh, depending upon the target let me have the target like. Uh, molybdenum target right impacted by electrons accelerated by a 35 kilo volt potential the potential between the cathode and the target or the anode anode target right. Then what you observe is uh, the following you have got a white light right it is called a Bramstrahlung radiation and apart from that you have got this is a continuous spectrum right you have got continuous spectrum the wavelength ranging, ranging from 0.2 to 1.4 angstroms the entire uh, big range the continuous spectrum apart from continuous spectrum you get the lines this is a k alpha line the, this is a weight radiation apart from this you have got uh, k alpha and k beta right. Now, the k alpha is the one that is generally used to probe the atomic arrangements in solids. I would like to emphasize this particular feature the factor namely this k alpha radiation coming from molybdenum target or copper target is the wavelength that is used to probe or to study the crystal structures. So, you should know the wavelength of the k alpha radiation because the intensity is high the k alpha radiation coming from any target it may be copper target and how to calculate how to know the wavelength of the k alpha radiation ok you know experimentally you can determine, but theoretically also one can try to infer what should be the wavelength of the k alpha radiation what is k alpha jumping from l shell to the k shell. If you know the energy of the k shell and the l shell then 
the energy difference will give you h nu right from that you can determine the the wavelength of the radiation. Now, let me ask you to work out this problem namely you use the hydrogen atom you use the uh, may be in the hydrogen atom what is the energy of the electron and hydrogen atom. Okay. The, they are the characteristic radiations right due to transitions in the atoms I told you that the k cell l cell and so on the, that k, k raise to k alpha k beta is a weight radiation it is called the Brehm Strahlung radiation. Okay. Then uh, again I will uh, explain the incoming electron it interacts and uh, electron is dislodged this uh, electron is k shell electron is dislodged from the k shell and so when the electron is dislodged the electron in the l cell drops to the k shell it gives rise to k alpha radiation whereas the electron is jumping from the m shell to the k shell it gives rise to k beta radiation right k beta x ray so k alpha and k beta are the two important characteristic line spectra that you get in copper target or molybdenum target and uh, one generally makes use of the k alpha radiation to probe or to study the crystal structures. Let me now ask you as to how you can calculate the okay, this is a thing that uh, the animation that shows. Now, what are the characteristics of x rays? A high energy electron or photon interacts with the electrons in the target anode atoms as I told you an inner orbital electron is displaced removed the outer electron jumps okay, that gives rise to k alpha radiation right. If an L cell electron is replacing a k shell electron is coming from L cell it is dropping to k shell then you get a k alpha radiation on the other hand if the electron in the m shell is coming to the k shell you get the k beta radiation that I as I showed you just now. Then now comes the torches which are generally used and what are the advantages and disadvantages of various torches. I will not go into the greater detail of the advantage and disadvantages, but mainly let us try to emphasize the materials used namely the torches are made up of either chromium or iron or uh, cobalt and if uh, you want to probe a material containing more of iron. So, in this case the most useful this iron target is being used when you want to study the, uh, the iron rich materials. Iron rich materials can be studied using a iron target right. So, the target material is uh, an important feature. Now, the radiation coming in the case of uh, the k alpha 1 the wavelength that is emitted uh, during the process which I described earlier in the case of chromium it is 2.29 angstroms in the case of this one is 1.936 angstroms in the case of cobalt it is 1.789 angstrom. But more than these three torches the most important torches are copper and molybdenum the most widely used torget is copper and molybdenum. Now, most of you know what is the wavelength of the should know or should remember the people who are doing x ray diffraction studies should by heart or should remember this particular value 1.541 angstrom. What is 1.541 angstrom? That is the wavelength of the k alpha radiation or k alpha 1 radiation that is usually used for probing for studying the crystal structures of most of the materials. Mostly people make use of uh, this uh, copper target best overall for uh, the anode target is the best one best overall for most inorganic materials. For shorter wavelength molybdenum target shorter wavelength good for small unit cells particularly metal alloys right you make use of molybdenum target right. And now we will wind up this lecture we will go to the, the summary part and uh, the let me summarize as to what I have done today for electromagnetic radiation to be diffracted by solids the wavelength should be in the range 2 to 3 angstroms or in other words x rays ought to be used to study the crystal structures. When a high energy electron knocks 
of the electron in the k shell, then the electron in the L shell will jump into the k shell giving rise to what is called the k alpha radiation. The torches which are commonly used are copper, molybdenum, iron, cobalt and chromium. These are the normally used torches. Okay. And you get the k alpha radiation depending upon the k alpha or k beta depending upon the uh, electron which is uh, falling into the k shell whether from L shell or the M shell. The important anode torches I mentioned just now, the, then the Bragg's law is of immense use as it gives the lattice parameters. Now, we will pass on to the question session, question number 1, what are characteristic x-rays? Number 2, how will you calculate the wavelength of k alpha radiation? Question number 3, how is k alpha radiation is produced? What is the range of lattice parameters in solids? With this, we come to the end of uh, lecture 12 and in the lectures to come, we will go through Bragg's law, the Lowe pattern and so on, the other things which are to be covered. Thank you.